Well, <coughs> hello, Pastor Ray Barnett here again with you in my office, and I'm continuing this experiment of a project that I told you about yesterday, if you saw the broadcast, in bringing to you the uh, program that we used here for quite a few years and some years ago which was called Renewed and I shared with you that the, the subtitle was God's Answers for Anxiety and uh, Depression. I also mentioned yesterday it was the theme of what I used for my my first uh, PhD and uh, I also shared with you yesterday that you know the the, the, the uh, program itself, renewed, the Renewed program, which we had for five or six years, had amazing results. It really did. So what I'm doing, in case you didn't see the first broadcast, is I'm running this as a kind of a, like, like television does, you know, it's kind of a pilot program. I want to see what type of interest I can generate. And... Um, I'll, I'll kind of base my decision on whether to continue these broadcasts to give you biblical perspective on God's uh, what God has to say about anxiety and uh, depression and mental health uh, disorders included in that. Um, how we're going to do it, how I'm going to do it. Yesterday I had a little bit of a problem uploading the video over to Facebook, so I had anticipated to do it with YouTube anyway. So, because um, the video was good, there wasn't any reason that I could think of that it was cutting out. The audio was cutting out after about 35 minutes. Some, some people were writing to me. So I uploaded it to YouTube, and as far as I know, it's been running okay there. Yesterday, last I checked, um, it was a pretty, pretty good amount of people. I mean, for a start when nobody knows, you know, just kind of spur of the moment almost for, um, well, not only me, but I mean, for, for most of you that don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. <laughs> I only hope that I know what I'm doing. Um, it, it seems like it's doing okay. I mean, it's it's running okay. The audio and the video is running okay on YouTube. So what I'll do is I'll do the, the teaching, then upload it to YouTube, then send the link over to you that are on Facebook, and then when you just hit the link, it'll take you right to my personal page. Now, we have two... Uh, YouTube accounts here at the church. One is simply called the Time for Truth Ministries, which includes um, Bible studies and predominantly Sunday morning messages, sermons. My personal channel, which is simply Pastor Ray Barnett, will have these teachings on it. And if I go forward with the project, with God's help and your encouragement, then that channel will, or that, that, that YouTube channel will be dedicated specifically to this issue and to these teachings. So that's what I'll do. I'll upload um, these teachings to YouTube. Now what I'm asking you to do is to, when you go, when you go to YouTube to listen, is to subscribe to it. And we picked, I picked up a couple of subscribers. Nobody even knows I had the channel there, so it was a good sign, I think. Picked up a couple of subscribers yesterday, and uh, a few views, you know, a, a modest number, but it was a good number of views. And uh, when, you, when you go to YouTube, just subscribe to the channel, then hit the bell, the button, that gives you notifications that will go to your smartphone or your computer or whatever to let you know that I just uploaded a video I'm not, I'm not trying to live stream as we do here on Sundays and Wednesdays uh, just yet. So I'll just be uploading these teachings because it's going to vary what time I can do things and um, 
you know, even your time. If I went live and that was it, and then we had no, it wasn't archived or whatever, you wouldn't get to see it. So when you go to YouTube, do me a favor and um, subscribe to my channel, Pastor Ray Barnett. And then uh, hit the notification button. And I would certainly appreciate it if uh, you'd hit the like button. Not that my feeling, not that my skin is thin if you hit the dislike button. You know, thumbs down. Nero. But, um, I guess there wouldn't be much sense in watching it if you didn't hit the thumbs down button, right? You wouldn't want to be part of a class, which is really what this will, will become. This will become an online class. Um, that's my, my intention. So, subscribe, please. Hit the notification bell so you know when my videos are uploaded and you can watch them. And then um, just hit the thumbs up, <laughs> the thumbs up button. How's that for a sales pitch? Um, today, what I want to do in remember in my meetings, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'll put the date on each video that I upload. Um, and maybe at some point in time we'll have to number them. Not necessarily because the sequence is important, but these first couple are, so that you'll know by the date, number one, number two, number three, just, just look at the date. And um, I shared with you yesterday what we will do, what I will do with you, is I will read through the program, and I'll read through the principles for God's answers, for the ones that I... I uh, made up and that I um, just coined myself after the years of experience that I had had both with the study of the subject of anxiety and depression and also the um, the experience which is what I'm going to talk to you about today my own experience with anxiety and depression um, and by the way you know it just occurred to me that my PhD is not in psychology Many pastors who have PhD behind their name often have it in psychology or counseling or something like that. My PhD and my THD, which they, you figure that one out, it's a doctor of theology. It's a PhD in theology, THD. Um, my, my PhD is, in, is still in biblical studies. Okay, so I advocate, and you'll find out today, I think, for good reason, or what reason at least, um, that we use the Bible and that the Bible is God's word it's, it's authoritative so I just I just want to mention that my PhD is not in psychology I'm not a psychologist I'm not a Christian psychologist um, I'm a preacher and in particular I'm a pastor pastors teach the Word of God and so I proposed yesterday what I shared with you how um, so many pastors today are very inexperienced with the subject of anxiety, depression, and mental health disorders. So they often uh, refer people out to the mental health system. Oftentimes, that can be very um, disastrous for, for a lot of Christian, Christian people with mental health disorders, anxiety, and depression. And by the way, this is not just designed, you know, whether you're a Christian or not. I mean, you can apply these principles, but they are really the biblical principles. So... It really is pretty much um, also a, a, a solicit, not a solicitation, but just a, um, a bringing to you of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Okay, so with that being understood, um, my, I advocate the Bible, and today you're going to find out why. Not just because I've studied it for 40, well, it's getting... It's actually a little bit more than 43 years. I've been preaching for 43 years, but I started reading the Bible before that. So it's about a half a century, about 50 years that I've been in the Bible one way or the other. And then, um, you know, I'm going to tell you my story and what, uh, what happened to me as a young man and how it led me to Christ. So that's why if you see the title underneath this video, it's uh, called My Story why I came to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say something here that may be a little startling for some of you who are you know, believers in Christ. And maybe a little startling for some of you who are, who are not. I've often told people after, well, 40 plus years of 
being in and around Christians. Um, somebody made a remark when I put up my, my music videos that they didn't know that I sang. Well, that's because I've been singing exclusively all these years just in church. I gave up the um, secular music years ago. Not that it's all bad anyway, but I just, I just did. And dedicated my voice, my singing, my musicality to, to Christ, to God. And, um, you know, some of you don't really know why I became a Christian, but I, what I started to say is this, um, and again, it's a bit, a, bit of, a bit of a dramatic statement, that as of today, between the denomination I was raised in as a child, and then the denomination that I belonged to when I was an ordained minister, and I was with them for 23 years, I'd never be a Christian today if it were for so many, many Christians that I've met, and especially leaders, Christian leaders. I didn't sign on, and this will begin my story, I didn't sign on to follow Christ for the same things that I was giving up, lying, Oh, I, I was never a thief, but I'm going to mention all these things, you know, stealing. And, and you see this, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Christian denominations. I've uh, done a extensive research on this one, too. And um, this apostasy that we see going on in Christianity is so widespread. It's like a, a cancer that has metastasized. There's not much of the body that it hasn't touched in some way. But that's not my topic today. I'm just simply saying that my story is a bit unique in how I came to Christ. That's what I want to talk to you about. And I wouldn't be a Christian today if Jesus didn't come into my heart and life the way he did, the story that I'm about to tell you. So, and I'm glad that he did, by the way, because I wouldn't be following Christianity. That's a loose term. I wouldn't be following Christianity. I don't know what I'd be following. I'm not sure what I would be doing. I don't even know if I would be alive. But I thank God, as we talked about, we just passed Resurrection Day or Easter. I thank God that Jesus showed himself to me to be alive and to be real. And that has always sustained me. My disappointments with professing Christians Christianity has been sometimes very bad, but I've never lost, ever lost confidence in Christ. And that's, that's the key. That's the key. Let me just read these principles to you, because that'll be the way I'll do the class with you, the way I did it with my students. I won't read all the references today, so I can get right to my story. But God's answers for anxiety and depression that, number one, we must never allow ourselves to be doubting the love of God. Now, there's scriptures with all these, but we won't do that today. You can't, you can't indulge in that um, there. No matter how hard your circumstances, you have to continue to remember that God actually does truly love you and care. Number two, if I'm safe, I cannot be in danger. Again, yesterday I told you it's a simple application of logic. You're either, it's the room is either dark or it's light. It can't be both. It's either hot or it's cold. It can't be both. All right, that's simple physics. Can't be safe and in danger at the same time, relatively speaking. Well, in most, most cases, you can't be both. Anyway, um, that's how we find answers, and that's how we find relief from anxiety, depression, mental health disorders in the Bible. Okay, again, I don't use a psychology book. I use the Bible. Number three, it is not God's will for me to be anxious or depressed. And these are things that I discovered on my own, by the way. You know, I wasn't taught these things. That's why I'm bringing them to you. Um, number four, my thoughts are not greater than God's truths. We rely on the Bible for this. Um, let me say in the first person. I don't permit myself the luxury of doubting what I've read in the Bible. Now, you're going to see... And here today that I have experience to to say what I'm saying that being said I don't permit myself that luxury yeah there's 
I've been studying the Bible all my adult life and still things I'm not, you know, clear on. Um, it's a massive book, 31,102 verses. It's a massive book. But um, I never permit my, myself the luxury of doubting Christ and his word and what's written in the Bible. Number five is anger is the friend of anxiety and the enemy of serenity. And the story that I'm about to tell you, as a young man, I was an exceptionally angry individual. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Number six is fear is the absence of the love of God. So this is really the heart of my story. But if we have, we're filled with fear, we're not filled with the, pre the presence and the um, perception of the love of God. When you know that somebody truly loves you, you trust them, you can, and when it's God, what is, what is impossible with God? Nothing is impossible with God. So, fear is then um, the, the absence of at least the perception of the love of God. You know, we try to feel a lot of things, and we can't feel everything. We have to just believe what God has said, even when we don't, quote, feel it. Okay. Um, number seven, I must never permit myself to go beyond my gifts and talents. That's just, like I said yesterday, do, just don't overdo. Number eight, um, worrying is suffering from responsibility that God does not want me to have. That's a great relief. That you don't have to be worrying about what others want you to do. Others say that you should be doing this and you should be doing that. Um, just do what God wants you to do. But we'll get into that when we get into the lessons themselves. Number nine, and this is part of my story too, my shame is pardoned by the death of Christ, his atonement. This is the, really the crux in the heart of um, the gospel. Number 10, Christ is my counselor, and I must never question his authority. Once again, in my life, and I've applied it, I have um, never permitted myself that luxury. It's not, again, that I don't have questions. I do. I have a lot of questions when it comes to the Bible. And there's some mysteries that I don't understand yet. But I don't question the authority of Christ. And I always say to people, I am not, I am not going to contradict Jesus. And this is how I found healing that I'm going to tell you about. Number 11, I must be patient with God, myself, my family, and my friends. As we grow in healing from anxiety and depression, mental health disorders, uh, and so forth, we, um, we have to find ourselves in a position where we um, are being patient, which is not easy. You know, when you're sick and you don't feel well physically, as well as mentally, it's not easy to be patient, yet that's part of the process. And then finally, I will advance if I refuse to retreat. That is also, um, I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? If, you, if you're not going to go backwards and you won't give in and you won't quit, then we have the faith, or you need to have the faith, that you will go forward, that you will advance and you will retreat. Okay. That's the basic foundation for our, our studies. Now, that all being said, I want to tell you my story. I was not raised in a home where the Bible was read. I, um, I did go to church. I was raised Roman Catholic and went to Mass um, every Sunday. Oddly enough, my, my family didn't, but I went to, to a Catholic school. And early on in my life, I developed, I mean very early on, just a, a, an awe and a reverence of God. And um, though I didn't know Christ as my Savior, and I certainly didn't know the Bible, I was never taught the Bible by anybody, um, that was always there, even in the periods of time that I'm going to tell you about now. This reverence for God. You know, I had a very vulgar mouth when I was younger. But one word, maybe two, that I could never get out of my mouth, no matter how much I was cursing and swearing, was the word Jesus Christ. Today, of course, we hear it thrown around quite a bit in films and whatever else is out there. Um, but I could never do that. There was always this profound reverence for Jesus, even though I wasn't following him, I didn't know him, and certainly was violating uh, God and Christ, you know, I mean, on 
so many, many levels. Now, about the age of 16 or so, like many young people, I mean, it's a difficult period of time for all of us. Or if you're, you know, if you're out there not right now and you're that age, it's a difficult time. Lots of changes going on in the body, trying to figure things out. And it takes some time, but I lived, I was brought up in South Yonkers. And South Yonkers was then and still is now a very rough place. And um, I never, you know, my, my family was, was good. I've always been appreciative of my mom and my dad. And, uh, and my family in general. So, you know, I never had that blame thing, you know, but uh, like, like far too many people do. But being in South Yonkers, you know, it was, it was rough and I always viewed it this way. And I tell people that, that you had two options as a, as a boy or as a man. The two options, you either fight or you flee. And I made the decision to, to fight, both physically and psychologically and so around age 16 really nothing dramatic about saying I was rebellious because well, how many teenagers are not rebellious the difference with me is that I was already carrying around a lot of hurt from the past and again I don't want on reflection I don't see that it was so dramatic as the many stories that I've heard over the years are. I would say it was kind of average, but me being a very sensitive person, um, it got to me. And then little by little, there was this hostility that was slowly building up in my life. Fighting, uh, I took up boxing, and I was um, slated for some really good things. I was very athletic, strong, very quick, had very, very fast hands. Um, had endurance that I could, I could go all day long and never got tired. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were picking me out for some really great things. But what happened to me was what interfered with my athletic um, abilities. My music, I was born with perfect pitch. It means I could hear tones in my brain before hearing them on the guitar or piano or whatever. I could, I could hear them in my brain. What interfered with my life as a musician and interfered with my life as a potential uh, fighter. And I look back now and I say, you know, it was just uh, so unfortunate, yet on the same hand, it's what led me to Christ. That's the story I'm telling you today. Um, why I came to Jesus Christ. And uh, I can sum it up in, in one word. I came to him to find peace. Peace inside. Remember where I was living at the time. In fact, even where I live now is not exactly um, the uh, Paris of the United States of America. I'll say it that way. But, and it's a rough town. Where I live now is fairly rough town. Not as rough as where I grew up, but it's, it's a rough town. And I think that's why God sent me here, because when people talk about things, I, I get it. I already understand. Okay, so all this hostility <clears throat> and anger was growing in me. You know, and periodically I was getting in trouble with the law. I wasn't a criminal, you know, and I never, I never did drugs. I never liked drugs. Still don't like them. Well, that would, would be obvious. But I just never, never liked the whole scene. But like a lot of young people, I, I drank a lot. And um, invariably, when I would drink, I'd get myself into trouble, you know, some way, somehow, or the other, um, because there's all this hostility that had built up in me over the, you know, the years, would come out when I was drinking and um, other stories I could tell you I am going to by the way put this into a book I've been meditating and thinking about this for many many years I'm glad I waited though to I'm older now because I can look back even more clearly and I think the book should be um, helpful to people because nobody actually knows the whole story except myself and I'd like to put that, that in a book that's my next project along with this one. In any case, um, so put the drinking in, 
with the hostility and the many street fights and other things that were going on. I'm training in the gym as a fighter. I'm getting really skilled and getting really good. Uh, I was a heavyweight then. Well, I'm a heavyweight now too. I was a heavyweight back when I was 16, 17, and 18. You know, I was pretty muscular and what have you. Um, I was getting better and better. So when I came into the streets, it was just, you know, just came out kind of natural when we when I fought. Put in the drinking, as I said, and then you had a really bad, really bad cocktail. I wasn't one of those happy drunks. Well, one night with my buddies, with my friends. I always liked having friends, I still do. Uh, so I'm with my friends and we're, we're drinking. And um, we were, I remember we were going to a, um, some type of party. I don't remember what kind of party it was, I just remember where it was, which was in the projects where uh, many of my friends lived back in those days. I just remember where we were going, we were going to Schlobums in the projects. <clears throat> the housing projects and we were just getting drink and we were going to this party and a friend of mine who I actually went to grade school with came along and uh, he had a reputation for being involved in a lot of hallucinogenic drugs I should say a reputation I mean everybody knew that that's what he did and he came along with um, some some pot some marijuana and um, Again, I didn't like drugs. I didn't. I didn't like pot. Of course, I obviously from there on out, I didn't like anything. I didn't like cocaine. Lawrence Street in New York, in South Yonkers, was one of the largest. What well, was the largest drug um, affected uh, streets and neighborhoods in the city of Yonkers? Yonkers is the fourth largest city in the state of New York, but it was also one of the largest in the country. There was lots of drugs. Lots of my friends became heroin addicts, obviously cocaine. I never liked any of it, including pot. I didn't even like the way it smelled. I still don't. But he came along, you know, if you had a few drinks in you, and in those days we had more than just a few in us, he came along. Now, keeping in mind that he already had a reputation for uh, getting involved with LSD and these hallucinogens, um, he lit up this joint while we were there. We were only drinking, and people started to pass it around. Now again, I wasn't even, I didn't even like doing it, but well, if you're, like we say, half in the bag, so I find myself smoking with everybody else, passing around, smoking. It was kind of, it was a big, um, well, it was a big st joint stuff with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of pot. Um, okay, so we did that. Then we got up to, to move to go get the bus. We're in South Yonkers, Schlobums is more, almost, it's not, it's not, it's certainly not South Yonkers, so we have to, I'd have to call it North Yonkers. And um, when we started to walk, I started to feel very, very strange. Then all of a sudden, there was this kind of a, a heat. You know, this heat just came through my body, but it wasn't wasn't good. Immediately, I was starting to feel very very frightened, which as that developed, now we're still walking. We haven't even left the park yet. I'm starting to feel paranoid, and this is what happened. And the story, by the way, that I'm telling you is exactly the way it happened. I'm not in, engorging it with you know um, lies. <laughs> I'm telling you exactly how it happened. As we're walking, and I'm feeling this tremendous heat going through my body, and this very uncomfortable, fearful feeling, in my in my brain, I began to hear a sound. Right, obviously the the pot was laced with something that I wasn't aware of. Uh, some hallucinogen, angel dust, PCP. I don't know. To this day, I don't know. And I hear a sound. If if you take um. It sounded like, the only way I can describe it, it sounded like a large rubber band and you could hear it being stretched. And then all of a sudden, there was just a snap in here. 
Now, keeping in mind up to this point, you know, the, the, the drinking and the hostility and the fights, and I can go into some of those details, but it's not necessary. Other, other than I'll tell you, I was in one fight where I received, uh, after I kind of beat this guy, he got up from behind and uh, came behind me with two broken bottles. I wound up in the hospital with 150 stitches. One of the uh, lacerations had hit me here in the chest and came one inch from the aortic artery. I always wondered to this day, well, I don't really wonder, but why I wasn't one of those statistics where you hear about a kid getting killed in a street fight. And we were fighting in the middle of South Broadway, right on the double yellow line. So it was a lot of drama. I'll put that in my book. I'll skip it for now, but I'll put it in my book. So I had a lot of brushes with, you know, close call, calls, some other ones too. But now we're walking through the park and I'm hearing this sound. And it sounds like a large rubber band. And when it snapped, or when, when I heard this sound that appeared to be like a snap, immediately I began to hear voices. I describe it this way. It was a lot like being in a dark room where there's a crowd of people but you really can't see anybody and i mean everybody's talking at once this is what i was hearing in in my well, i'll say my brain but let me jump over to now say i want to say in my spirit the first thing that that came to me not because i knew anything about i had no idea what was happening to me but the fear multiplied a hundred times. Now I, I'm in another dimension, though I'm physically there. And I don't know that anybody would, would notice because everybody was so high that I was as paranoid as I was. It turned into a paranoia. And um, the only way I could describe it is it was like being, all of a sudden I entered into another realm that I never knew existed. And I'm experiencing something. But here's the thing that struck me. The intuitive feelings that I had now crossed the line. That was intuition. I had now crossed the line from which there was no going back. Now the fear is just increasing and increasing. So we go to the party. Every motion, every move that people made. It was just total paranoia. Somebody pulled out a comb. I thought it was a knife somebody's looking at me and I'm wondering, you know, um, you know, typical for those of you who know what I'm talking about, you've had a bad experience with LSD, a hallucinogen, PCP, whatever, angel dust. That wasn't the unusual part. It was, it was the intensity of it. And I remember just wanting to go home, just go to bed. And I thought that once, if I could just get myself to, to, to go to sleep, you know, just like, drinking in the morning it would be over and then you make one of those um you know deals with god if, and i'll never do this again and i remember just being so un unbelievably scared as i'm still hearing these voices and now they're talking to me directly now they're saying things to me well i go to sleep and the voices continue all during my sleep for whatever how many hours i was in bed and by the way, I want to just uh, put a parenthesis in here and tell you that I, I don't enjoy telling this story. I really don't. I would have gave up telling this story a long, long time ago if it wasn't for the fact that I know it's helped a lot of people. Because, you know, you see a preacher like myself and, um, you know, letters behind my name and um, some of the success that I've had in ministry and so on. And you all of a sudden you just think, you know, well... He's never had any problems, so what does he know? One of the reasons I've been able to relate to people is because I've had not only problems, but in many, many cases, I've had more problems and worse problems than they have. And I've had quite a few, well, a lot of people in front of me. So I, I, I tell you that it's not easy to talk about this again. It, it dredges up bad memories. But I do, um, I do it, so I know it helps you. Okay, so... I wake up, the voices are still there, and now they're unbearable. I remember going to my father and telling him about this. And this is where everything starts to get a bit hazy. My mind is, I'm in another dimension. I'm physically in one place, 
yet I'm spiritually in another place at the same time. Now, you could, again, you could understand that if you've done hallucinogens, and then when they, they wear off, they wear off. This didn't wear off. So I'm in two places at the same time. I'm here, let's say, on Earth, and then I'm in this dimension where the voices are constantly speaking. And what I recall is just talking to my dad about it, and, you know, he at first probably didn't understand what I was talking about, but wound up to see a psychiatrist. Never had been to a psychiatrist before. And then it was my first, after that, hospitalization. So they brought me in, United Hospital in Portchester. It's closed down now, but um, they had a psychiatric floor. Brought me there. Which now that I'm, I'm looking back, I had actually been in there once before for an incident with violence. Or I should say not violence, but that anger fighting thing and what have you. It'll be in the book. But this time was different. This time, again, I'm realizing I've crossed over into a, um, an area, a dimension, from which there's no return. I knew that intuitively before the diagnosis came out, which said the same thing. Okay, so here I am, and the paranoia just is day and night. The voices are day and night. And they're, they're putting me on all kinds of drugs, Haldol, Thorazine, Melaril, Stelazine, Dilantin, phenobarbital, trying to figure out what is wrong with him. But as the days and the weeks are going on, nothing's changing. Probably the saddest thing that I can think of in this story is the time that they laid me down after the decision was made. And by the way, I was actually begging for these treatments. I uh, can think that probably the lowest point was when they began to administer electric shock therapy. All right, so if you don't know anything about that very quickly, it's electrodes placed on your head, a little jelly to conduct the electricity. Uh, again, I'll write it in the book, but where they got this idea from, you would have a hard time believing that's the truth, but it was from a psychiatrist by the name of, his last name was Sir Letty, who watched um, a farmer treating pigs this way, seen how it paralyzed them, Put them into a seizure and somehow he came up with the idea that this would be a great thing for my patients all right another topic some other time and um here i am being treated and the voices are still there the problem with ect treatments electroconvulsive therapy is that it erases your memory now that's what it's supposed to do what happens with ect treatments is once you're given one you go into a grand mal seizure so they put a block in your mouth uh, obviously uh, you're on a gurney and uh we'll go through all the details of how it's conducted but how it's done but um electricity goes through well, you're already knocked out though i had one treatment that the psychiatrist gave me after i've researched this um where i was not sedated there's a theory behind it, but it's pretty stupid and pretty cruel. In any case, one time they gave me treatment where they didn't give me any um, sedative to put me out. I should say anesthesia to put me out. That means I had the anectine, the drug, uh, if you think of a curare, you know, the, the drug that paralyzes you where you're fully awake but you can't move any muscle well that's where I was I was fully awake as they're going through the procedure putting the electrodes on my my head putting the block in my mouth and I'm trying to scream and I'm screaming inside of how frightened I was and I don't want this the psychiatrist just standing there and saying you know don't be scared don't be scared this is going to be okay and I'm, I'm I, I couldn't move so I have the um the drug that they give you for any operation, you know, uh, they use various ones, but mine was a nectine. Um, so I can't move, I can't speak, I can't object, I can't get off the table. Then whoosh, electricity going through the brain and electricity knocked me out. This, uh, I must say, was not helping because it was palliating the symptoms a bit, but it wasn't taking them away. Now that I am facing these treatments, 
my fear is growing even worse, if you can imagine. And I, I lived in this condition for about three and a half years. While everybody else was in high school and making plans for the future, I was just thinking of one thing. How do I get out of here? How do I survive? And when I would get out of the hospital, I would go back to school and nobody really knew. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't and couldn't explain to people what I was going through. And I, I, you know, I mean, I acted normal, um, but the torment was always there, as I explained. So, you know, it began this merry-go-round of being in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the hospital, out of the hospital. Similar, if you heard the, the broadcast from yesterday or watched it, similar to the woman I described who came to my class for 33 years of that. Thankfully for me, it was three to four years. Uh, for her, it was 33 years. It's unthinkable. So now I'm in this situation. I mean, I, re I remember, I'm going to use my comb here, you know. I was so drugged, not with illegal drugs, with psychiatric drugs, Haldol, Thorazine, and so on, that I would fall asleep in my meals, couldn't, couldn't raise the fork to my mouth to eat my meals. I was so heavily drugged, I don't want to say sedated, I wasn't sedated where I couldn't, I couldn't uh, function, but I could barely function, barely. One of the things that the ECT treatments in particular has done to me, and I've read hundreds of stories just like mine, that patients complain about afterwards, is that your memory is gone. There's one year of my life I have no recollection of at all. Friends of mine have said, hey, don't you remember we were here, we did this, or it was like I wasn't there. Because ECT, the object is to put the patient into a convulsion, a grand mal seizure rather. Well, they're both the same. Grand mal seizure. And wow, it just it just deletes, it's like a tape. You know, here you start, and then this part, and there's something missing there. Well, for me, it's about a year's worth of memory, memory loss. And I say this, don't think that this is a left-handed compliment when I say this, but um, prior to that, not only did I test very, very high in, in music, but I also, tested very high with an IQ, a high IQ. What turns my life could have taken had I not done that one thing? And by the way, for people who said, you know what, just going to try it once, whatever it may be that's contrary to God's laws and God's book, and you say, you know, it won't be me. Well, in my case, it was me. One time. That was it. I mean, with marijuana. One time. And I would tell the doctors that it was that, and they said, no, that just kind of brought it out. It was always there, and I knew that was wrong. And by the way, now studies have come out since then that, is, that are proving, these are in reputable universities, they're big universities around the world, that are proving that marijuana can, can induce psychosis and or schizophrenia, which was my, my final diagnosis um, in the average person. But I was telling them from the beginning that I didn't have this. And, um, well, they never really listened. But what difference did it make? I was in this condition. And back in those days, um, you know, it was, um, medicine was starting to advance, but it wasn't like it is today. But even though psychiatry uh, and the, the treatment of the, the severely mentally ill people it hasn't changed a whole, whole lot. Somewhat, but not, not a whole, whole lot. I mean, it's much more merciful than if you read about the 17th century and the 18th century and so on, but I was in this condition, as I said, for maybe three and a half to four years, totally lost. I mean, lost, very lost, very frightened. I wasn't even so much angry anymore, just really, really frightened, frightened, scared. And again, you know, I do well for a few months, boom, back in the hospital, a couple of weeks do well for a few months. I mean, if I would function, I wasn't doing well. But function for a few months, boom, back in the hospital. And more shock treatments and more medications. And I was on this merry-go-round, this medical merry-go-round for, again, three and a half, four years, something like that. Remember, keep in mind, again, what I said, I'd never had read a Bible. I had never 
Um, never knew much about Jesus other than what I was taught as a kid, you know, which which was good, but it wasn't what I know now. And I went through this, and then what I would I would compound the the drugs by drinking, which is a very very bad combination, a very very bad combination. And um, I would drink heavily while taking. I wasn't abusing my medications. I want you to know that while taking these medications, I'd be drinking very very heavily. And there was times I, I would just um, wake up in my vomit. And um, meaning that you know, my stomach just emptied itself. I never woke up. And I'm going to continue this story in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. I'll be right back.